Hello and good evening. And as you might have seen, we are nearly perfect. Nearly. Sometimes our mouths have their own life, and our technological gadgets are、um, a bit out of control in a little way, such as they develop their own life, like an honest robot would do. On that spot, I should give、uh, Thomas a warm,、uh, waving hand from Austria, where our friend Christian Knoll has bought the similar camera Thomas is using when he is、uh-huh. using his highly sophisticated gear, and、um, <laughs> he just said,、uh, "Give him a note that I have the same toy." So done. Tick list, and for today, we are going into the fantastic good times again. Such as we want John Reed. Yes, <laughs> that's him. The way with a with the a interesting whiteboard in the back. Yeah, the one and only. And yes, CRM convos, baby. Here we are. <laughs> Chaka, and a topic. Where John might not know how I'm involved in, such as I was the last existing and living only、uh, CRM Expo project manager in German-speaking Europe, which was a spin-off of the、um, CRM whatsoever、uh, from Barton Goldenberg, which he has had a running show in the US over ages, and. After the CRM Expo has been sold to a fair in Stuttgart, and they combined it with some two other interesting fairs, they all went to dust. So far for history. Interesting enough is we had two years of challenge, two years where we have moved from. Loving and hugging people, giving away all the good stuff as swag, swag as it's called in the U.S. or Geschenke und Werbemittel and all the fun stuff from a pen to nearly a highly sophisticated camera gear, or whatsoever is useful or not useful. We had at a sudden a breakdown. Everything stopped, and everybody you ask these days. About、um, why it is such a challenge? God no! Why it's such a challenge、um, that Thomas take over? Do we need to take the why call? Is it, why is it just a challenge to put the phone <laughs> somewhere? <else? laughs> Feel yeah, free to take ma- the phone call. We can always get back to the show. Yeah. The, the main the、um, main challenge is obviously reconciling the physical and the digital worlds, as we see right now, <laughs> in a live event, <laughs> which begs the question: How the heck to do that? Yeah, and clearly we、hybrid. need instructions on that, and, and hybrid and Skellis and John. Yeah, and hybrid as one solution is a real fantastic one, and. Luckily, if you are in the non-digital world, somebody drop by and picks up the phone for you. Yeah. So, oh, well, some, somebody John, has their phone switched off. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> um, not possible. Otherwise,、uh, I have to cut off all my connection lines. Didn't work. Tried it. <laughs> or、oh, just put that one away. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Anyways, so John, the main, the, we have physical events. Sometimes they are、mm. disturbing. Sometimes not. <laughs> sometimes they are even helpful. And we have digital events, for which the same applies actually. So, Indeed. And what is disturbing in a physical event might be highly desirable in a digital event, <laughs> 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 or the or the other way around. So now, now the question is one of the main questions that that I would have, and that's basically to Ralph and you is how can that get reconciled? Because the world changed, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So,、um, 
I have been writing on this topic of hybrid events for quite some time, and I have some pretty deep experience yep. in, in event production. Um, and my fundamental view is a little bit uh, dark, <laughs> which is that I, th I think on-the-ground events are basically almost broken, and virtual events are basically broken, and hybrid events are mostly a profound failure up until this point. But there are some promising changes that are happening. And uh, I can go into that a little bit. But the, the potential power of hybrid in this case of a so-called hybrid event is, is basically sort of fusing the best of both worlds in a sense. Like those mm -hmm. who, um, though, like you think of it a little bit like CX. Why would a consumer want to only shop in the store? Why would a consumer only want to shop online? Wouldn't they want a fluid experience where they can kind of get what they need at any given point in time? A hybrid event potentially can provide you with much more of that. Now, the downside yeah. is that the downside is that most event producers are really at a loss for this. Um, and to some extent, I think sometimes they feel overwhelmed. And so part of my message is not just a critique, but practical sort of next steps to say, you know what, you can make some progress towards this goal. And it's actually not that hard, even if I sit here and acknowledge to you, which I will right now, that full scale hybrid events are a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But you can build your way towards that. And there's some very meaningful steps. And for today's show, I have some new content on this topic that I have not ever shared before. So... For your Woo! listeners and for you guys, I have that. So that's kind of sort of the basic parameters. But but underneath my of view, course. and I, underneath my view is I'm a fan of what you might call radical inclusion. And yeah. I think hybrid events provide that opportunity to reach people. And part of my radical inclusion philosophy is that a lot of people who aren't at your event are every bit as important as the ones at your event. And a lot of vendors don't understand that. They think that, oh, because you're there on the ground, you must be more important, passionate, committed, loyal to my brand than those who are not. But unfortunately, yeah. that's a very myopic outlook in this world. And even as the concerns around safety change a little bit for some people, now we have the issue of the economy and the fact that a lot of people are going to have a hard time getting travel budgets approved to events, but they're mm -hmm. still your loyal customers. So does it make any sense to prioritize access and experience based only on those who, for whatever reason, the stars align and they're on the ground with you? That makes no sense. And that's the basis for this conversation. I really appreciate these warm words, and I see um, a lot of experience in them. I see especially that you have seen and lived through the challenge that there are the typical old-fashioned show and exhibition organizers which have not adequately learned digital, they are in a falling back position such as, thanks God, we can do the old shitty stuff again and go back and make some experiences which are not as pleasant, not only due to travel regulations and challenges, but also that people found it quite attractive to have something to participate in, to be selective, and have all the benefits, probably not the swag and the nice conversations aside and the coffees, but we have uh, uh, the, the, the beer, yeah, the beers, sorry, I forgot <laughs> the beers and the drinks. So aside of having no headache afterwards, after the event or during the event, um, there is a lot of beneficial sense in it. What I love to know is why for Christ's sake, do such um, professional companies like my dear friends from San Francisco, which are doing an event the day after tomorrow in Dusseldorf, and they know that if they ask for a dance after Dreamforce in one of the larger German cities, that they will be booked out, why not do it hybrid 
not to disappoint people that they cannot participate. Yeah. Mm. Um, if you have a small hotel and you plan for, well, let's say it, a thousand people, but you could have had 10,000 viewers on top. Question for me. Now, back to the expert who lived through these several years on that. Um, what are some of the <clears throat> tips you can give not to make all that mistakes, which one definitely run through? By the way, I love the back channel notes around how we skip the intro. I think that's awesome. <laughs> like that's that's one of my event keys is like skip the bloated intros. Who cares? I'm John Reed of Diginomica. We're having a great conversation. Let's keep going. Um, and who doesn't so, know, who doesn't know you by now is not interested uh, <laughs> or not interested. <laughs> so okay, so so Ralph, I think there's there's a few yeah. there's a few stumbling blocks that event organizers need to overcome in order to yeah. achieve this. One is they need to uh, overcome this this fear that they're cannibalizing their in-person event by offering a quality digital experience. And that's a real fear for a lot of event organizers. And I just want to assure event organizers, this is very much like politics. There's very few people sitting on the fence. Mm -hmm. They're either yeah. going to your event or they are not. It's that simple. You, you're not, there's not a bunch of people. I have never heard someone say, Oh my God, I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to the event because the digital experience looks so awesome. We are so far away from that. So yeah. don't, so, so, so first we put that aside. Second, we have to put aside this idea that this is an impossible achievement, you know, because sometimes people think, well, this is so difficult and, you know, we can't live stream everything and live streams are scary and blah, blah, blah. The technology and tools are there. I mean, look at folks like us. We are not deep technical video practitioners. Some, a lot of us on this call have some video experience. We're streaming live right now. We are not on the phone with tech support. So we've, we've come a long way with, with streaming. Um, Hi, so <laughs> Hi, Alan. And Alan makes a very good point. Um, but rethinking events is, is a little bit of a slightly different angle on this topic, but um, there are some discrepancies between what vendors want to get out of events and what customers want to get out of events, and there will always be some tensions. Mm -hmm. There will all, always be tension there, but there's also, fortunately, a middle ground, which is that everyone wants better projects and better results. So fortunately, from that middle ground, Alan, we can have some common ground. Now, um, where vendors need to start to give back some time in particular, and this is after having attended about 12 events this year in person, is they need, they need to wake up to the fact that making people to fly across the country or the world to sit down for half a day and listen to keynotes is a terrible use of time and energy. So vendors have to start by giving back some of the keynote time on the ground. So that's 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 number one, Alan, in terms of bringing things closer together. It doesn't mean that you don't do keynotes, but there are some very creative ways of changing event structures to limit the time where you do that type of keynote. I'm talking about the type of keynote where the entire event stops and nothing happens except for the keynote and exactly. people get and people get all angry if you try to do anything but attend the keynote. That's what I'm criticizing. There are other ways of doing that. This is a little bit of a side conversation. For example, you you have a shorter main keynote and then you have a bunch of optional industry focused mm -hmm. keynotes that are more relevant anyway that occur at the same time where people can do a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> So, so you start by giving the, some of the keynote time back, but you can still do some keynotes. It's just that you have to start going on a keynote diet because you have to start thinking about how virtual has changed us and thinking about the fact that I can watch that keynote from home. So, 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 so you realize, okay, hybrid events are doable. Mm -hmm. they, they, you can take steps towards more elaborate hybrid events. Um, there's no one sitting on the fence, so there's no fear. Um, there's a huge bonus of inclusion. Oh, and by the way, a lot of data gathering, which, as we know from a CRM convos context, is kind of nice to have digital exhaust and data on people who might be interested in your products and services. That's kind of cool, right? So, so you can do that. And, and, and then the bottom line is that sometimes you have to sit and say, you know what? 
we don't have all the skills in house to do this. So we are going to engage some outside experts. This is not a plug for my services because I don't really do this, but we're going to engage outside experts to help us rethink how to do events to Alan's point. You need some new skills in there. And if you, and, and if you do that and the skills are there, they just might not be within your organizational walls on your event team right now. Talking, talking about the keynote. So what, what I observe being there or were physically point. there or digitally there. Yes, they are long and often I zone out. I, I just zone out, which basically goes into the topic of giving some time back. So they, but th that essentially also means that they need to be a bit more engaging. So how, how to achieve that? Yeah. Um, so keynotes are, are, are kind of a different type of thing. Um, and, and we oh, could yeah. kind of have probably a follow up discussion if you want on rethinking like the on the ground portion of an event. Cause you could spend a whole hour on that. But, yeah. but, um, one of the big things is that enterprise software vendors are on the wrong track because they think, that they have to entertain with keynotes. But here's the problem with that is that we're spoiled as viewers. We watch yeah. things like Game of Thrones, Succession on HBO. We we have a Lord high bar things. for entertainment. Your yeah. your your cheesy stand up and bogus talk show format doesn't entertain us. So okay, so Thomas's point, what does engage us? Authenticity. That's what engages yeah. us transparent yeah. conversations that are authentic from the stage, not an overwhelming desire to entertain with bongos and marching bands and, you know, celebrity people. How many vendors get celebrities interviewing customers that don't know what the customer is actually dealing with, but the celebrity is doing the interview. And it's like, Oh my God, <laughs> you, you don't even, you can't even ask a relevant question, you know, like, like for example, here's a wild idea. Put, have a customer panel as part of your keynote and let a customer run the panel. Whoa. You know, we didn't approve the questions. Oh, my God, what could happen? The customer might ask what the vendor could do better. Oh, my yeah. God, this would be shocking. So, but that's the unscripted live authenticity that engages people in a B2B context. But most importantly, no matter what happens in your keynote, you got to get it done in an hour, an hour. Yes. And send people send people on their way. As I said, you can have a follow up keynote that's more industry specific, but the you know, key there is the key there is that the entire audience isn't required to go there. And so, what you realize is that our goal for this event is for people to improve their knowledge, make their projects better, and improve their networks. Those are the goals. We can all agree upon that. So we free up their time to do that: to educate, to meet each other, to network to do more informal peer sessions and we can talk about how you reinvent on the ground. But from a virtual and hybrid standpoint, what you're thinking about all the time is two things. How do we engage the virtual audience in meaningful ways yeah. based on their needs? And this is where I have some new content for you. And also how do we develop a quality inventory of resources that we can then share after the event? Because hybrid is not just about the live event itself. Hybrid is also what we do with our assets that we accumulate from a content perspective during the event. It is amazing to me. I can think of three vendors of shows I went to this fall that filmed a ton of stuff. They didn't stream it because obviously you can't stream everything. It's just too challenging yeah. at, at, for most vendors. But they filmed a bunch of stuff. And you know what? They didn't release it in a packaged way to people who didn't attend the show. That doesn't make any sense. You have all this interesting content that people who didn't go to your show would like to see and they didn't release it. So the point is part of it is rethinking how you approach event content assets after the fact as well. And I can get into the new content, but I don't want to talk too long here. It looks uh, like Ralph wants to the say reason, something. The reason why I um, raised my hand virtually and uh, analog is that um, going for Alan's question again, um, such as why go people for an on-site event from the vendor perspective their currency is still leads new contacts and to create business or to approach to create business and 
they seem not to took the curve to do this in virtual events as adequate as they did it in the learnings of the old goals, old time analog physical contacts, and we have the leads. This was um, stated by at least five vendors we spoke through in the last two years. I don't go for anything virtual because I don't get the real leads out of this. How did you solve that? Right. Okay. It's a really good question. And, and, and by the way, on, on the ground, like this notion of lead gen is not a conflict with putting on a good event because mm. if you put on a good event, those on the ground yeah. will have a good experience. Where the conflict comes in, what you didn't mention, is that vendors also perceive on the ground events and virtual events as messaging opportunities. And that's where the conflict comes to a head, is that the, the your attendees are not looking to be branded to and messaged to. And so that's the part of the goal that is that is a fail. The lead gen and prospect goal is a legitimate goal and, and you meet that goal by providing valuable experiences and demonstrating that you have a vibrant peer community around your product that the prospect or customer can get further involved with to their benefit and to the benefit of their project. Now, on a virtual capacity, here is what I have come to understand. There's really three audiences, and it's important to understand these audiences. Okay. One of the audiences is the audience that wants streaming keynote. I just want to see the keynote. Like I want to see Larry Ellison, what he has to say about healthcare. Or, you know, you name the charismatic CEO. I want to hear what they have to say. Yeah. This is a terrible lead gen target. Terrible. You don't know who the hell wants to, you know, I want to hear Larry Ellison. That doesn't mean I'm ever buying your software. I, I might want to hate watch that keynote, you know? <laughs> um, so, so the, yeah, I'm not, yeah, saying, like I'm every, not saying every that's database me, admin in the world is going to want yes, to watch it. Most right. of them are going and, to handle it. Yeah. And, and here's where the other conflict comes in that I realized, which is y all the technical problems that you run into in your embarrassing stream are caused by putting that keynote stream behind a firewall and having all kinds of login issues. So you stream your keynote publicly and you go for reach and you have backup streams so if one stream breaks, you have another stream and the marketing people don't like it because it screws up their analytics because they can't see exactly how many people are watching. Yeah. Who cares the hell with them? That's not a useful metric. What's important is a reliable live stream of your main stage. So yes. that's that's audience number one. But that's not really By the a way, lead let gen me interfere audience. here right away yes. for a second. As LinkedIn regularly has trouble with these types of streams, whoever is listening here, us, and sees an interruption of the stream or a looping of the stream, just go to YouTube, CRM Convos. Or there you go. Facebook. Exactly. Or, or, or Facebook or whatever. That's the brilliance of the multiple streams. Yeah. When one stream goes down, you link to another yeah. You even have one going, you have a raw feed on Twitch or whatever. Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so that's that's number one is is you have your keynote stream. Then then there's a there's there's and, and these were hard things, by the way, for me to accept because I yeah. at one point thought that everyone wanted an online interactive experience, but I've come to realize that's not true. So so the largest audience is your streaming keynote audience. But then you have a more relevant legion audience, which is mm -hmm. those that want to watch specific sessions. They're mm -hmm. mostly customers, but there might be some prospects in there too. But there are people who are interested, for example, in you know how how do you service the the software industry, or how do you service the retail industry, or or what have you, or 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 what about your development platform? What's the news there? How do I integrate to Teams and Slack? Whatever specific session based content. Well, what a coincidence. You have a lot of sessions at your conference. So you can look at potentially streaming those. Or in some cases, you won't stream all of them. But like I said, you will package them and make them available after. Now, the key is you can't wait like two weeks while you screw around with it. You have to like mm -hmm. get that done. But the point is, to Ralph's point, Ralph, that's a legitimate lead gen audience. Because if someone is interested in, in the retail version of your solution, 
they're going to give you a little bit of data in exchange to watch those sessions. Mm -hmm. And they may even pay a modicum uh, you know, to be able to consume that content. But the more important thing mm -hmm. at that point is their data because um, they, you know, whatever they spend on a project with your licenses and your software is going to be way more than whatever you would charge them to attend the event. So yeah. you have to decide. But the point there is that's a legitimate lead generation audience. It's people who are engaged enough with a particular topic that they don't mind passively consuming information either then maybe they can ask a question live which is great but they also don't mind consuming it later in some cases as well so that's audience number two then there's a third audience but i'll i'll stop for a sec see if you want to cover something yeah looking at the keynote audience whether so and looking at me again so what i usually want to get out of it is information into where i really want to dig in later right mm -hmm. so this of course it's always better if there is someone who is kind of charismatic in front of it and delivering incredibly also well i'm looking at a, a satya nadella for example who is incredibly good but in delivering that but he to, to me he sometimes has the wrong script because he doesn't do do the lead in ben, benioff is well he, he he doesn't open the avenue for the for the detailed keynote that you mentioned whether that's an interesting or a to industry not interesting industry keynote or a topical like ai follow-up keynote or whatever yeah S same for benioff so he's well he learned to perform amazingly in front of a camera <laughs> in the past two years <laughs> Well, that, Absolutely. That's something of that's something of a solvable problem in a couple different yeah. ways. One way is to have someone come on stage about five minutes before the audience leaves and says, "Okay, here's what's in store for you today." Uh, you know, we're about to break yeah. off into a bunch of industry-specific smaller yeah. keynotes or whatever have you. The other thing that some vendors are getting good at, and and by the way, I've raised my overall score. From, on hybrid from an F to a C minus, and I'll, I can explain oh. why I've <laughs> gone up from F to a C minus um, in a bit. But but one of the things that some vendors are doing is creating a little bit of a TV studio format so that mm -hmm. after the live stream ends, you pop into the TV studio. Now, I'm going to say that some of the TV hosts are cringeworthy. Um, so th there there's some acquired skills here as yeah. far as... I think the biggest lesson I would try to give these these hosts is you don't need to put on a show, just be yourself. You know, yeah. um, you're, mm -hmm. you don't have to sell you're not you don't have to sell anything to the audience. You don't have to say, Oh my god, that was the most amazing, inspiring keynote I ever heard, because that's not gonna that's yeah, that's really you've already that's really given up your credibility yeah, saying yeah. that. Exactly. So just say, you know what, that was so that was interesting. Um, if you're interested in this topic, you know, and, and, and to Thomas's point, you start sort of guiding people. Yeah. And um and SAP Tech had pioneered this a couple of years ago on their virtual streams, and we are having some dialogue about this, but they had kind of a lounge room that was always streaming where people could pop in yeah. and um, mm -hmm. and ask questions. And a lot of it was just directing traffic and saying like, hey, you know, hey, in 15 minutes, this is going to stream or, mm -hmm. you know, in, in an hour, yeah. there's going to be this or or there's some replays available and people could ping and, and ask questions and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this. And in some cases, yeah. you would have someone separate in the chat monitoring that chat and saying, hey, I'm going to direct you to a project manager or I'm going to set up a meeting for you after the show or yeah. what, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. there might be, like sort of a catch all. So, so that's one really creative thing you can do. Uh, during an event to kind of address part of Thomas's problem, which is you can get a little disoriented and be like, where should I go from here? Yeah. And that can be a big problem engaging virtual audiences yeah. as well. Um, now, what I have discovered that's very, and, and what I think is very exciting is is the third audience, which is ah, I see. Th there's a third audience that has an appetite for real engagement virtually. And mm -hmm. now this takes a little bit more resources to engage them and it takes some work in some sense because they're not used to being engaged in this way because they've gone to so many bad virtual events that mm -hmm. kind of forget they forget the art of the possible but i have seen it enough to know and i can give you like kind of an example so you can have a premier engagement stream where you and you can even potentially charge a decent amount of money for this where you promise like 
uh, live interactions for people who really want to pony up for that. And of course, to Ralph's point, you can get a lot of data from these people because they will share yep. with you in exchange for that. Um, but so, for example, one really cool format I've seen for that is uh, I went to a show where as people rolled off the keynote stage, they would come to the private virtual room for a while and shoot the shit with the virtual attendees and say, yeah, you know, here's what I talked about on my keynote, blah, blah, blah. Logistically, that all doesn't always work when you have a real event going on at the same time. But the point is, you could have other people from that person's team in there, perhaps. But the point is that they're rolling off the stage and there's this kind of a really cool backstage feeling of like, yeah, yeah I'm not at the event, but I feel very connected to what's happening because people are sharing you know, on the ground responses with me and I'm asking questions and I'm interacting with other attendees and, you know, so there's a real opportunity for a smaller percentage of people that want that more engaged experience. And, and that can be very exciting because, um, some of those people are going to be some of your most engaged customers and prospects. They might be people who got sick right before your show and couldn't make it and are heartbroken not to be there. They might be people who, are disabled and aren't able to travel or yeah. immuno immunocompromised. Yes, that does exist and not able to travel yet. And, and they, these kind of people, I hope event organizers realize they're kind of depressed about the shift back to real events because now they're being excluded again. Whereas before in virtual, they were on equal footing. So there's a real opportunity to engage these people, but it does require a little more creativity and requires more facilitation skills. Yeah. And like I said, so, so there are some skills barriers here that have to be overcome, but the good news is there's a lot of people who know how to do this. It's just that they probably don't exist in your marketing and events team. Mm. I'm sorry, but they don't. You have to humble yourself and accept that. We're not all good at everything. Not? <laughs> we, we try hard, but we don't succeed. it. And that is exactly why I was so, um, let's say, emotionally touched when I read one of the posts, it's so cool that ha 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 announced that event. And the moment we have the posting here to get more people, it's booked out. Why the heck are you doing this to the audience? And I could only say, well, <coughs> you haven't thought it through. Well, mm. too bad. Yeah. I went, I went to a couple of events that was really interesting this fall and why I'm moving up to a C minus. And by the way, I'm, um, I, I do want to just quick, quick, quick disclosure thing. Um, I, in the past, in past years before the pandemic, I went to, uh, Diginomica partner events and a lot of non-partner events, but I don't want to live out of a suitcase right now. I travel fair amount this year, but I mostly went to partner events. And so I'm trying not to name a lot of vendors because they're all our partners and it starts to feel like a commercial. So that's the reason I'm being a little vague sometimes about, yeah. Uh, vendors, but but um, I went to a couple really cool events, Ralph. To your point, where yeah. there are phys- there are physical capacity limits sometimes in certain sessions, and one of the really cool things you can do if you're doing hybrid right is you you shift over to the live stream. So yeah. mm-hmm. so uh, if I can't get into a room because they're you know you've maxed out the attendees in that room, you shift yeah. over and say uh, you know in person is full. Um, shift over to the stream um, or shift over to the replay. And, 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 and that's why vendors are getting a C minus right now is they're doing a much better job. A lot of them of making those things more possible. They're not always live streaming it, but they're at least giving you some options for replays. And in some case you can switch right over to the live stream, which is pretty cool. It's like, so now you don't have that same limitation of cramming everyone into a room and, and having to turn people away, which is really depressing. Yeah. In years what, past, uh, Sorry, um, sorry. Didn't see your hand. In years past, you know, that was one of the good things about being press or analyst. Whatever was happening with the keynote was being, well, not streamed, but simulcast into the press and analyst lounge or the working room. So you didn't have to be physically right. in mm-hmm. the hall to get the information. It's not quite the same thing as we're talking about now. It's also not but, vastly different. Yeah, but it yeah. was it was the pre-streaming version mm. of what we're talking about now. It's a different way of handling your audience. And mm. that is something that I want to get back to eventually is the way audiences are handled. 
consider that if you go to a physical keynote, it's supposed to start at, say, 8.30 a.m. It's not starting at 8.30 a.m. But the audience in the room, they're there, and they are talking to one another. There, there is something happening there. And while well, I, well, mostly while you're, mostly you're listening to really bad music at that point, Marshall. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but you've got someone there. right next to you. That you can yeah, play. yeah, 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 yeah. You're setting up your laptop if you're if you're one of us. You're you're getting organized. Getting yeah, organized but now imagine being a virtual Twitter. attendee to that yeah. same um, keynote, and it's supposed to start at eight thirty. It doesn't go off until eight forty five. Who's going to sit there fifteen minutes waiting for a stream to start? Yep. I mean, and, I've and, done it. Yep. But a hundred percent. And this is where these virtual tv moderation studios really come in handy yes. now now to your point what a lot of vendors have been doing in the past this year is rolling still footage like previous interviews and stuff like that before but that's problematic because you're trying to figure out is this live yet what's going on it's very confusing yeah. what you need to be doing when at that point marshall is you need a live studio setting where where there's a where there's a countdown on the timer to when the actual yeah. keynote is going to start. Even if you have to reset it a couple times, that's fine. The point is people can see it. And then, yeah. and then there's a, and then there's a couple people talking, here's what's going to happen today. You know, blah, blah, blah here. You know, there's a couple news releases already issued. Uh, if you want to check out the site, blah, 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 whatever it is, you're kind of doing that. And, and now you do have to find some skilled people for that because that is unscripted, you don't know whether it's going to be five minutes or 20. Not every person can get in front of a camera and do that, but there are people who can. And to your point, that helps to solve that problem because now if I'm a virtual attendee, I know, yes, my equipment's working right, which is always a concern at that point. <laughs> you know, yes, when the keynote goes live, I, I should mm -hmm. transfer over and yeah. see it. Yeah. But now I'm just listening to the pregame. It's just like a sports thing, right? Like where where you tune into this so called football game, and it's like there's a bunch of talking heads. Well, that's exactly what we need to do here. Let's, Another problem. Sorry, the ante on on that one a little bit. So yes, the keynote sometimes starts a little bit late, which often I assume is also deliberate. This yeah, is I, the, the perfect I've been chance it many to times engage into a Q and A with the audience. Now, yep. the, the audience that is there physically as well as digitally. And he, here comes the most embarrassing thing of any digital event, which is the live stream of comments on the right side that often comes, hey, from here, hey, from there, and also from here, and where, whatnot, mm. which is between right. ridiculous and... Well, nonsense, basically. How right. could that be brought into a more meaningful, uh, into a more meaningful context by fostering or initiating a conversation that stretches the room and this, well, this stream? <laughs> A survey, for instance, or um, a dedicated topic you motivate them to discuss on in the time before things started. Tell us what you're interested in, something like that. Or did you test it, John, and have an answer to Tom's question? Yeah, I mean, Thomas is right. There's a limit to, like, unfiltered streams create problems. And... And, and and vendors, yeah, Alan. Vendors need play-by-play -play and color commentary. They mo mostly they need they need what what you would say broadcasting chops. Is Alan is how I would put it. Mm -hmm. And there's different kinds of roles in that process. But we're we're content producers now. That's the thing. We all need these skills, and vendors are no exception. Um, but 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 Ralph, um, yeah, like so so the unfiltered stream vendors love it because it gives that sense of like oh you know there's so much action look every yeah. 3 seconds another comments yeah. coming on yeah. but of yeah. course to thomas's point the comments are crap so so, uh, so that's not very useful yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. this is my right. role as moderator as yep. um, marshall mentioned and yep. i'm running a hybrid event on the 18th of november the third time in row 
because a customer's day of one of my friends in Berlin has been blown due to pandemic reasons. So the customer day in November was spoiled and we were looking for an opportunity. How can we save our asses? They were it first time completely virtually uh, and they were shocked and then uh, and we created a concept which which worked out the next time last year the second time we did it hybrid such as the messaging the business blah blah on the um, on the um, morning till lunchtime and then cut and then something um, we offered them a meal they could have on the, uh, on our expense yeah. or they joined in the afternoon in a real event and there was no business talk it was just fun grilling having some fun today or on the 18th we are going to have again on the morning the business stuff the sessions speed dating la 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 in the afternoon we go on a sustainable solar driven boat ride where we like to entertain them give them some food and have some chit chat now that is one way one can do it if you want to combine socializing and business messaging yep is that a way to do it well it it is and there are times where a combination of the two work well there are also times especially with smaller events where a separate uh, to your point, I think a separate virtual and on the ground component can be useful. Yeah. Um, you know, not, not every time people need to be included in, in everything. I think what, what I just want to get across is that yeah. creative event design is powerful and yeah. creative event design does not conflict with your lead gen and prospecting goals. In fact, it enhances them. However, there's limitations to your messaging and branding goals that you have to accept because you don't get to dictate to a captive audience in the same way. So that's really the major thing. But Ralph, yes, there's a lot of uncharted territory in creative event design. I'll give you one example of where I learned the hard way where hybrid can go wrong. Oh. Um, you have an analyst day format where two analysts can't make it. And so you just put on the speakerphone on the table and then they listen on the audio speakerphone for six hours. That's not a good hybrid experience. Nope. And, and so now I would make the argument that the analyst day format is very tired and, and that making analysts sit in a windowless room for six hours while you spew PowerPoint junk is a crappy format. But um, it's an even worse virtual format. So in that case, what I tend to recommend is separate events. So, you yeah. know, do do your in-person event may, and and hopefully make it as creative and engaging as possible and then potentially do a separate uh virtual engagement event for analysts who are international who can't make it or who couldn't make it. Now, now granted you could have a little bit of overlap in that you might go for one hybrid session during your 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 gathering day like maybe an ask me anything session with the CEO yeah. gets mm -hmm. get gets the live hybrid treatment but you you have to think about these things right because it is a fact that yeah. i might sit for 3 hours in a room and be perfectly happy i'm probably not going to sit in front of my computer for 3 hours and be perfectly happy so you have to think about those things and i have had to learn the hard way that it, you can't automatically turn an event hybrid and call it good you know yeah. But I want to give Alan a warm um, feedback in the way that the first virtual um, analyst summit with Freshworks, I enjoyed really, really much. Yeah. I got that fantastic um, wooden box. Uh, the popcorn was eaten up quickly. And I, I, I was, um, from thinking about sustainability, this box is still uh, around, uh, is used as uh, to carry along gear, for instance, for such hybrid events. Yeah, And the cocktail mixer is having a real beneficial all the time use when we have guests. And luckily, we have guests again. Yeah, So, Alan, that was marvelous. Right, but the, you know, the thing is that even if Alan hadn't sent cool stuff, 
the event mm. still would have been really good because it, Al, it, Alan Alan was on the forefront. Alan, yeah. see what happens when you show up in the chat, Alan. Like <laughs> good good things happen to you. A- Alan was in the forefront at that time of trying to engage the audience in a more compelling Absolute. way. Absolutely. Yeah. So so you you recall they, they had an ask me anything CEO session at, at yeah. Freshworks at that time. It was really yeah. good. And that, uh and and it, even though it was virtual, it was highly interactive and worthwhile. Absolutely. This was my lighthouse event um, to for others as a benchmark, honestly, because I enjoyed it so much. And even that the chap from Australia who was in the middle of the of the morning, um, uh, sitting there and 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 joining and coffee after coffee, still kept himself awake. This was outstanding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, no and that's this whole thing is that sure. that's worth getting up for, right? Yeah. Like, like that's worth. I'll, I'll get up at two in the morning for an event like that if I have to, you know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just sleep in and catch your replay, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, that that is something that can also very well be translated into a, a hybrid setting, right? Especially yep. the ask me anything if you have a yeah. moderator. Then there can be questions that come out of the live stream. There yeah. can be questions that come out of the room, or even question that come questions that come out of the next room, because the capacity is full. So, yeah, yeah, I have a I have a slide to illustrate that if you want. Well, if you have, no, it, right. yeah, well, just just bring it on. Yeah, there is a knock, present, and then you are on, man. Let's see. <laughs> you know your tools, don't you? Let's see. Oh, that's not the right. Those those are the wrong slides. Well, oh, then, no. well, then, uh, but it was an interesting slide uh, as well. Let me let me try one more time here. I nearly I nearly had removed Ralph now. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, add file from all of the sudden the windows. I wonder changed. if there's an easier way to do it. I think maybe share screen is easier. Th- those live event skills that we were talking about before yeah yeah, yeah. um we, we should invest in that because <laughs> i know i don't have them well this is what makes life events fun here we are do you what see makes it makes them credentially yeah i do is that brent yeah. yep so yeah that is brent so um pa- pa- this wasn't the slide i was going to show you but but um but this is another one which is like analysts are getting in on the action in this case brent from the crm players he was this is part of a live stream that that paul and brent were doing at oracle cloud world Mm -hmm. and and you know they were having people drop in and this was in the middle of the room and stuff so it's it's neat to see um individual media producers getting involved in streaming as well and they they do like watch parties and by the way i think it's perfectly fine to have chats running over keynotes for a live stream as well uh, mm. I know vendors freak out about that, but actually, remember your goal is building community, positive community, not not messaging. Yeah. So okay, so this was really cool. Um, you could see this uh, slide on the hybrid session. So, so this was really neat. This was at Planful in the spring, and you could see some folks in the room. This was a meeting with the Planful executive team, but on the TV there. Are, there was a CTO who couldn't make it. There were a couple analysts who couldn't make it. I think one for COVID reasons. Who knows? Anyway, they worked him into the into the conversation, and uh, it it wasn't always like perfect, seamless. But if you asked everyone, I think they would have universally said it was much better to have those people in the room with a little bit of awkwardness than exclude them from the conversation. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. yeah. Well uh, these are slides that I made for f- for my Friday taping with Vinny on Vinny Merchandani on his show. We're going to do a um, a review of um, the event season, and I, so I'm doing hybrid stuff. And so uh, Vinny, uh, hopefully he's not watching. So Vinny will be like, "Oh, you're <laughs> you're screwing up your your slides." But there's just a couple more I can show you if you want to see. Um, like these are just really simple, like. But like you can see this hybrid event layout thing where it says like um, it clearly labels like in this case on demand following event. So it shows you like how you can consume the session, uh, you know, which I think is really useful. Oracle Cloud World had a similar thing where like 
session format in person, in person and on demand, live stream and on demand. That's incredibly useful stuff. And I think that's yeah. Yeah. that shows that shows you. And then afterwards here, um, you know, Oracle has it set up so that uh, I'm pretty sure you can register even, you know, if you didn't attend the event that you can still go back in. That's that second audience I was referring to that cares about your session content you know, yeah, and, and yeah. not so much the interactive part. Well, make your inventory of content available to these people. And anyway, uh, vendors turning into live TV studios, Ralph, there's your favorite example, Salesforce. Uh, you know, they were one of the pioneers of doing this and they're offering it to their customers as well. Um, but that thing around like, you know, the more you have kind of a live studio vibe, the easier the hybrid uh, event experience becomes. And then finally, yeah. finally, I gave the overall grade of a C minus. Having said that, uh, you know, the there is areas I think where we're, we're, we're beyond C minus, but one thing I became aware of is that I mostly go to business application conferences, technology, but on the business side. And I think on the geekier side, there's more exciting stuff happening. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been interacting with an individual who uh, is the founder of um, a company called uh, Dexper, which is a hybrid event company platform. But he uh, is doing a GitHub thing this week, and mm -hmm. and he he shared with me, for example, uh, a dev, a DevOps conference he did, uh, where they brought in people from all over the world, including Ghana and Bangladesh, virtually, who would never have had a budget to participate and to get into San Fran, mm -hmm. and uh, you know take the opportunity with both hands to interact, and and I think so. I think on the on the deeper tech community side i think people are just a little geekier and a little more experimental maybe it's the hackathon culture of technical events mm -hmm. yeah. there i think there's a little more comfort level with like experimental formats so yeah. i did want to make clear that i don't think the shows that i went to are necessarily on the cutting edge of hybrid trends and i think we would look into the deeper technical geekier communities for probably more creative hybrid experiences that I haven't partaken in as much. So I can't speak to those as well. Mm. But on the other hand, it's probably that we are still at large, we are still on the crawling straight when it comes to uh, yep. combining virtual and, and, and presence sure. events. So it's, it's probably a good thing that at least the bigger vendors stick to the ropes and tools that they have and learn before they go all into well whatever whatever verses yeah so the, yep well speaking of i mean working with what they have yeah um, e e even combining something like a watch party with the actual event is something that well is not really tried out yet isn't it uh watch party yeah well ah, yes <laughs> Sorry, Marshall, what were you no, saying there? I was saying, but um, extending off of that, uh, and something that you said earlier, John, about um, those the skills for doing hybrid events not necessarily being within the company. Uh, and, you know, we've mentioned com uh, vendors like Salesforce who have a robust events group within the organization or Oracle that yeah. does – Uh, what should smaller organizers do? Uh, smaller, sorry, uh, Vendors. organizations mm -hmm. do if they're trying to put on a hybrid event? I mean, should more companies be looking to hire that talent or train that talent, or is this for the experts? You know, get someone who knows what they're doing to plan your event for you. Well, I don't think there's one right formula to that, but if mm -hmm. if I were doing it, I'd want to cultivate some in-house talent with some hire some creative young people mm -hmm. who are creatively into video. There's a lot of uh, folks who have tried to compete in the influencer game, filming their own videos on mm -hmm. platforms like Instagram and Twitch who have struggled to monetize because it's actually very difficult to monetize. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of enterprise opportunities for folks like that who have a lot of interesting skills. 
uh, that I, I don't actually think it's too hard to do it because there's also outside talent. Now, would you build a huge broadcasting studio? No, but, but none of us here today are operating out of a broadcasting studio. Uh, Thomas is probably the furthest towards that goal and he's invested in a fair amount of equipment and route and you all look spiff, but we're not, we're not at the high end of broadcasting studios today. No. And we're, we're, we're delivering, I think, a B2B content. And, you know, so, so it, a lot of folks have enough homegrown skills in these areas to begin to engage. I think the biggest thing is the humility of saying we don't have this in house and that's okay. I think if you can just accept that you're a little out of your element and be open to engaging with other people, I think you can find the experts out there who mm. can help you. The big part is realizing that you don't need a huge broadcast studio to do this. You don't need to be to be Salesforce or, or Oracle to, to, to do this at all. You know, you just need to be a little more open to thinking about how we include people and and kind of realizing that you know, this this notion of, yeah, it's so great to see everyone is sort of what you hear about the on the ground, but it kind of lets you off the hook because people are so happy to see each other that you can even put on a so-so event and everyone's still really happy because they got enough out of it. What I always say is on the ground, you can kind of hustle and get what you need because you're there. Mm -hmm. Even if the event's not perfect. You know, if if you get on a plane after on the ground event and you didn't get what you need, that's kind of your fault. Because, yeah. but virtually it's different. How do you hustle virtually? <laughs> it, it's yeah. it's 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 really tough. So so vendors have to come up with those creative ways, like we discussed, of like 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 having a drop in lounge room. Mm -hmm. But you can stream on a platform like YouTube or Twitch so easily and say, hey. During the entire event, we're streaming in this one room. Just come in and drop in with your questions, and we'll what, help you. What we did in the first virtual event on my customer side, we created an engagement kit, such as we had a magician who did a magic show where he was integrating the audience with some of his tricks. The other thing is they got a complete box within two boxes in the box. There was food. There was engagement stuff in, there were note pens, um, little pencils, something to play around with, cards game, and the magician's kit box, such as that you afterwards mm -hmm. could try to repeat the tricks, Bold, build a little ship, fold it, and all that stuff. We really tried to get them during the whole day in engagement sessions, and yeah, we, we succeeded. Yeah? That was fun. Yeah. Well, I just wish more people. Planner, oh, sorry, Marshall, you say. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> if you need an event planner for hybrid, hire Ralph. And yeah, we, I think Ralph's made a pretty good case for, for himself. For our events here right now. Sorry if I interrupt right now, because we are at a decision point. We are ah, at the juncture of point. extending or wrapping. <laughs> so looking at how the flow is, I'd be in favor of extending for a bit, but that depends on. <laughs> <us. laughs> Woo! Made the cut. We can go on a little longer. Yeah, cool. Time, sure. <laughs> cool. But Super! You, just, you just need to give us the sign when when it's really getting tight for you. <laughs> sure. I, I think it's. I, I think Ralph hit on the important point, which is be energized by the art of the possible. Mm. That the art yeah. of the possible is not beyond your reach, and that goes for yeah. both on the ground and. Yeah. And, and virtual that it, it can be done and there's really cool things you can do and and you can tie them to data and metrics now is it always perfect no i mean uh, but your email list isn't perfect either you know yeah. and you send out your yeah. newsletter you know so uh you know but the point is that engaging people in an opt-in basis is powerful and yeah. and you can do you can do this through events and the biggest thing to think about is that is that community should drive events, not the other way around. And we really need to to not just have this go back to this thing of like, oh, we have our big event every year, and then we exhale, and then we start planning the next big event for the next following year. That's not a good way to think about yeah. life right now. What we need to think about is how do we engage people throughout the year in ways that are compelling for them? And if we can figure that out, then events become part of that way that we can engage people. Yeah. And 
look, looking at, at experimental things, what, what we did for some events is we, we had a CRM convo at some events. We mm -hmm. had, I was at events where I was in a hybrid fashion as well, kind of being in a journalist matter, interviewing, streaming. Yeah. As well as attending, which caused a conflict of interest for me, by the way, because interviewing customers while sessions were running made me right. lose out on, on those sessions. So still uh, that causes and needs a, a significant equipment on the ground as well as for the people who are participating. So well, I was lugging around a bunch of suitcases yeah. that I wouldn't have had <laughs> if just being there. And on the other side, the, the network quality of the event location needs to be up to the notch as well. Because <laughs> there, especially if there are a bunch of people doing the same, then yeah. there's so much interference in the system that, that that's beyond crazy. Yeah? So the, it was a very good, I think it was planned very good. The idea was very good. It should be repeated. But the infrastructure needs to be better than than, than what we had. So uh, yeah. this was an, no, you make a, an amazing you make experience. Really, yeah, you make a really good point, which is that sometimes we're, we're held hostage a little bit by the limitations of the technology at a particular yeah. event location, yeah. right? Yeah. Like some of the godforsaken hotels we try to do events in are just not up to snuff with, with, with live streaming. Yeah. But that... But but that these are problems that you you face head on. Some of that you you do spend some money solving, um, and then to some, <laughs> is hate watch a checkbox. Ab absolutely, you can hate watch, no, no doubt. I mean, your lead gen people want to know about that for sure because yeah. they probably don't want to be emailing the hate watchers after the event, Alan. So you make a really good point there. But but like so, for example, like. Like I have a very portable kit and I haven't used it too much yet, but yeah. I may I can do LinkedIn Live on my laptop with USB lavalier mics and and a nice webcam um, okay. that I can carry in a very small yeah. backpack. So I'm very portable, but I've made the decision on extreme portability because I want to be able to set up quickly. Um, yeah. But but and here's the thing: if I was at an event where the live stream wasn't working, I would switch into record mode. And just mm -hmm. record what I'm doing oh, yeah. instead, and 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 vendors need to plan the same way, yeah. um, because the inability to sometimes live stream is going to be a fact of life at yes. times, yeah. and you have to accept that. Now, for your keynote, you you can't have that. For your keynote, you need fail safes and all kinds of things to make sure that thing streams. But for all the stuff that happens after that, you will have live stream breakdowns and issues. And yeah. you have to be prepared to record stuff and to say to people, sorry, the live stream's down, but we're recording all of this. We're going to be able to get it to you yeah. later. And, and that, that's is a, a lot of a learning, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. That's a hell of a lot of a learning. So Wi-Fi, just talking technology over here, Wi-Fi doesn't cut the mustard. No. Bluetooth doesn't do either. So whatever... Interesting. Needs to, there needs to be wired as part one. Yeah, it needs to be wired and it needs to be recorded at the same time. Yeah, and like that picture I showed you of Brent, their setup there, they mm. were in just like the main media area, but yeah. they did have a hard wire connection that they were using, yeah. and and he was super psyched about that because he's like, this reduces a lot of my potential headaches knowing that I'm wired yeah. in from yeah. this location. Some of that is just money, so you you know you might have to like you know cut the food budget and just serve cold sandwiches, um, and and emphasize the broadband you know access yeah. for a little while or whatever, or make people choose you, hot lunch or broadband. You know, just take your pick. <laughs> you can't have both. You know, yeah, but fair uh, <laughs> but oh, you know, maybe maybe don't maybe don't waste money on like ten DJs that are like overrated and who cares, and, and put that money into. I think we can find the money for this somewhere in your yeah. event budget. Yeah. If if you want to run your event budget by me, I'm pretty sure I can find. Make it save save the money on the um, the marching band and uh, invest it in your broadband, and and I think it, it's going to yeah. go better for you. Yeah. yeah. If, if your audience is talking about the food, 
mm-hmm. after your event, you've done something wrong. There you go. Talking about what you said. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You can go with pommes and currywurst if uh, you have some authentic and extraordinary uh, speakers. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah, and just hire yeah, wh- 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 whoever DJ. the LinkedIn we'll user is. <laughs> Wi Fi, then food. <laughs> yeah, I Wi Fi first. Um, yeah, topic. I would like to. Th- I would like to think that. I would like to think that we don't have to choose between those two things, but I guess it's possible in some cases <laughs> that yeah. budget could come down to that. I guess it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Before we beat her out, I've got one question that is good for the famous last words. Mm. And I know the M word riles you a little. That's why I bring it in. How far? becomes uh, this m verse oh <laughs> uh, yeah you know it's funny events. i was gonna say just don't make people wear a headset to to attend your show you're gonna ask a metaverse question right yeah so in how in how far well not everybody can afford a holodeck and it's probably a bit too tricky yet <laughs> but in in how far in a in a better world can that become a thing for hybrid events It's a really good question, and I'm not, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet how valuable the putting on goggles is in terms of the kinds mm-hmm. of interactions, for example, that we're having right now. Yeah. Like, like I'm not sure, for example, for networking, it's a big enough incentive to experience it virtually to endure the learning curve. But where I do think the metaverse can be powerful is is things you want to show someone. So if you want to show someone how how to operate your digital twin in a mm. you know in a, in a workplace setting like maybe the metaverse the immersive aspect of that is is compelling I don't know I mean I I would be a little bit careful at the moment because I think so much of what we talked about in this conversation is a failure of creative imagination yeah. and 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 there's also the need not only to create better events, but to, I'm not naive. We need to create the metrics and KPIs to document yeah. that these events are helping us with our bottom line. So I think that's job one rather than like worrying about, Oh, wouldn't it be cool to have a metaverse component? But I do think there are, are there, there could be a place for that. I mean, at the moment, the technology is not readily accessible enough to, to think about doing that. It would end up being more of an exclusionary thing. Um, if, if you're serious about it and you think it could be compelling for your audience, I would probably start by having something on the show floor at your on the ground event where you get people used to donning headsets that they don't have to purchase and show them some things they can do on a headset that they might not expect, such as a product, maybe an interactive product demo or something like that, or have them interacting with a specialist who's not in the same location. So I would probably start with education rather than entertainment and start by making that part of your show floor and see what kind of interest in adoption there is from your attendees and go from there. You know, I'm, I'm not completely down on the metaverse. I have been um, just, just frustrated with, with the notion that it's a revolutionary thing. And I, and I, and I, and we've talked about this before, but I don't think yeah. that Mark, Mark Zuckerberg and Accenture should get credit for, for stuff like digital twins and virtual reality things, which have been in development for a long, long time before they came up with these words to try to make yeah. money and save their company in Zuckerberg's case. So that's my thing. But I, I think there it's always worth exploring these things, but yeah. I would say create like hands-on lab settings where you can test your attendees' interest in these topics and and educate them. Don't make them go buy expensive equipment to be involved. To Alan's point, hybrid events are about accessibility, and that's making events, I think, less accessible. Yeah. Yeah. So, How about this? What I was actually talking, thinking about, not talking, thinking about was a possible VR setting when it comes to this lounge that you mentioned a couple of times. Mm. Yeah. Because mm. that, that, that would make could not would could make conversations a bit more conversation like you roam around 
you form your conversation circle with two or three people and might just be an idea. And if you're in a virtual yep. space, yeah. you can hear it. It's not like yeah. being in a typical yeah. chat room yeah. where yeah. it's text flying yeah. by. Yep. And it might work without the glasses as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean I have a pair of Quest headsets and you know I'm I'm open to trying them for things like that. Um, and and I think it's yeah. worth it. I think I think we're in the experimentation yeah. phase with that. Yeah. And and I think if if, if it's optional, then I think it can be interesting. Yeah. If it's required, then I think it starts to become yeah. problematic. No, but no, no. but I think it's interesting. Yeah. 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 I think it's interesting. I mean, I I will say like when I put the Quest, my new Quest head headsets on, and like like it's kind of like a console area where you can choose where to go. And you're hanging in, in my case, I'm hanging out on this like weird Island with like this like weird lake in front of me and this little patio. And it does kind of feel like you're there. I mean, it's kind of a cool, a cool feeling. Yeah. Whereas like during this conversation, I still feel like I'm in my video space, mm, yeah, yeah. you know? So I think the metaverse does have a, a chance to make a more immersive type of experience of being around people maybe that would be really cool at some point so yeah we should be experimenting with this if we can do it in a way that doesn't exclude people yeah mm -hmm. that's as close as you're going to get to a metaverse endorsement from me so yeah. <laughs> yeah. that well, sounds well. like what we would advise for any other technology yeah. either have a reason yeah. for using it or admit that you're experimenting mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely and of course, the question was intended to rob you a little. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I mean, you're going to get me. It, it's it's. Pr I'm pretty much predictable. It's like you can wind me yeah, up. He has a Just, button. Yeah. E <laughs> yep. Either that or Web 3.0, and mm. and you got you got me going. So yeah, coming December five. Oh uh, yeah. Forward to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a little I got a little preparation to do before I can dismantle web 3.0, but I'm working on it. Well, that that'll be a blast, I think. That'll be a blast. Yeah. <laughs> Preview coming attractions. Yeah. After the shameless plug here. <laughs> okay. I think this was an amazing episode. Amazing, Agreed. amazing, amazing. The hour went faster than ever Whoop. ridiculous Whoop. and that's rocket like and yeah. we still have an audience here although one of my parallel streams showed that linkedin is already in a loop again <laughs> uh linkedin's in a loop oh. <laughs> so well linkedin stream yard get that bloody fixed S sorry for my french but do it <laughs> yeah thanks for Thanks to you. Thanks to the audience. So it was great. I had fun. Yeah. Oh, and had thanks awesome fun. conversation, the, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to right. all of the vendors who have brought yeah. us out in yeah. years past. You can <laughs> still invite us. It's okay. Yeah. We'll yeah. come sometimes. Yeah. And, and it was fantastic that um, we have had you again after a short while with us. Because yes. we really enjoy your spirit, your energy, and your enthusiasm on the topics you are talking to, and even jump in to be our Vinny Merchandani <laughs> and uh, to to help us where you can with Absolutely. some thoughts and ideas which take us forward. And this is the spirit why we do it, not for the money, just for fun. And Absolutely. for getting people excited, engaged, and going forward to the fantastic times which are coming. Yeah. Thank you. Not My pleasure. Money, Thanks, guys. We, we would appreciate sponsorships in spite of yes. yeah. <laughs> we, we, yeah. we love to get some money, oh. but um, <laughs> unfortunately, nobody is uh, throwing it at us. So um, the bright future yet. will come. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yet. Thank you very much for being I'm with sure. us. Thanks, everybody. We are going Thanks backstage all. now. Backstage. Bye.